Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and A.J. Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. We are live uh, again, loving this new live format. If you are watching, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. We're talking about uh, preparing your volunteer teams for reopening. As we were, as AJ and I were kind of going back through all the stuff that we've put together, all of the um, materials and resources, which, by the way, if you've not yet accessed that ultimate resource bundle, um, we'll put that link in the comments for you so you can download that. Uh, but as we were putting all these things together, we realized there's one big hole that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, and that is preparing your your volunteer teams um, for uh, reopening. And hello from Texas. Glad to have you on here. Um, and uh, I'm interested um, if, uh, if in Texas you guys are starting to reopen soon. I know that it's allowed now, and uh, I'm in Tennessee, and we're allowed now. Um, Dale turn, uh, tuning in from New York. I know you guys are still probably several weeks away from... Um, any sort of phased reopening. Arizona. Great. So glad you guys are hopping on here. So we're talking about getting your volunteer teams ready. It's kind of something you need to start working on, AJ, like maybe yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some implications for your volunteer teams. It kind of snuck up on us, didn't it? Like, you know, we went into quarantine and with like a week's notice, and it almost kind of feels like now we're coming back out of it with like a week's notice. And a lot of churches are like, oh my gosh, how are we going to handle all this? And what are we going to do? Yeah, it's right. And so there's been a lot of moving parts. And, and so again, as AJ and I were talking uh, and preparing for this week's podcast, we were going, what's what's a gap? What's a hole that we maybe haven't looked too closely at yet? And um, one of them seems to be making sure our volunteer teams are good to go. So um, let's not waste any time. We're going to give you a today, we're going to give you a three um, step process for getting your plan together for your volunteer teams. That's what we're going to do. Um, and this is a three-step process for you as the leader. What do you, as a leader in your church, what do you need to do um, to get your volunteer teams ready? And so let's not uh, beleaguer the point here. Number one, point number one here is audit your volunteer positions. Audit mm -hmm. your volunteer positions. So AJ, when we say audit your volunteer positions, what exactly do we mean and what are we asking folks to do? Well, well primarily um, make a list, right? I mean, sit down yeah. and figure out where actually do we have people volunteering? Where do we need people to serve? And a lot of churches, probably most, actually have never really kind of made this list, have they, Scott? We, we see this pretty frequently. More often than you would think, you were surprised. Um, maybe they kind of know what their different – volunteer opportunities are, but they don't know who serves in what capacity in what team. Individual yeah. ministry leaders know, but they often don't have a centralized list. So when we talk about auditing your volunteer positions, what we mean is we, you need to, number one, make a list of all your teams, and then number two, figure out who's serving on all of those teams. Um, and there are a couple of things that we want you to look out for. The first is, who is serving in too many teams, right? Um, you often will have folks who, um, they're not just double dipping, they're triple dipping, quadruple dipping. Um, I don't know how to go past quadruple dipping. Whatever. It's a lot they're, of dupes. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're dipping a lot. Uh, and, and so our recommendation, just when we work with churches in our leadership pipeline process, is that people should not serve in more than two places. One place where they're more of a key leader and able to really lead people and make decisions, and then in another area where they're more like a frontline volunteer and, and just kind of have to show up and be a warm body. So for example, someone could be a small group leader and a greeter. Um, you know, small group leader is more intense and involved, um, and then a greeter is less, less intense and less involved. Um, so you need to figure out what are all your positions and then how many people do you have on the team, uh, in those different teams. Here's why yeah. this is really important, AJ. Um, 
the number one most important factor as it relates to the COVID-19 um, crisis is that you need to know who of your volunteers, particularly the ones that serve in children's ministry, but really across the board, are in a vulnerable population. Mm-hmm. Um, because those are folks that you should not expect to come back in whatever your first phase of reopening is. And two, you should not ask them to come back to volunteer. Don't you think? Um, Most certainly, yeah. And I, I don't know. It, not that they wouldn't volunteer. Struggle with, yeah. And some churches may struggle with, should we just tell them you cannot? You know, do we want to prohibit them from doing I think that's a conversation you can have, you know, amongst your, your staff. But um, we really have to be careful in this regard, you know, especially depending on what your city is, how badly it's been affected, uh, you know, just what the population of your church is like. But unfortunately, this is a real world question that we need to ask ourselves. Should we should they be allowed to a um, or or B, should we just give them the option or not? So going yeah. to have to work through that. Um, it's similar to when we first started um, this process of kind of shutting churches down, the on-site thing. Um, early on, even before it was mandated in states, I was I was recommending that churches go ahead and and suspend in-person services. And the reason is that the people who are most likely to be susceptible to this disease are the most likely to show up the second the doors are open. Um, yeah. Yeah you know, the people who are under cancer treatments or who are in a vulnerable position or whatever. And so in in some respects, I think to care for them best and to love them best, you have to take the option off the table and say, you know, we really don't want to put any of our, you know, um, members that are 65 plus in the position where they might be serving in children's ministry. And, you know, there's no stopping a kid from coming up and hugging you. You know, or, you're, or touching toys that have germs on them because the kid licked them. Like you, you can't protect them in that environment, and so you have mm-hmm. to keep them away from that environment. So, yeah, you need to audit your teams, and you need to figure out wh- who's serving on what team, how many people do we have in each team, um, who's serving in too many teams, and d- d- go ahead and take this time to do some readjustments there, and then. Um, you know, who's in a vulnerable population, because that's going to help you figure out where some recruitment, we'll talk about that in a little bit, needs to needs to come down the line. Any other thoughts, AJ, on that first step of auditing your team? Yeah, two more things. First of all, it's probably the other most common thing we see in addition to people, you know, quadruple and multi-duple drip dipping is uh, working every single Sunday. So, you know, that's that's another thing. A lot of times church might make a list and they're like, hey, here's our ideal volunteer situation. But you probably have to then double it um, so that you really only have everybody working maybe every other day or twice a month um, to avoid burnout on these volunteers. So that's maybe a little bit more advanced than you need to deal with right now in the midst of COVID. But as we begin to move past that, you know, that's another thing to consider is taking the load off of your volunteers so that you can, you know, just have them be fresh and, and get more mileage out of them and, and have them serve in a capacity that they want to serve in and not one in which um, it's just a challenge constantly. So consider that. And the other thing, let me just hit a couple of other brief points, again, more in a post-COVID ideal volunteer management situation. You would understand job descriptions for your volunteer positions. You would understand uh, the best competencies for volunteers in those roles and even spiritual gifts that fit best in those roles. So that's a more advanced volunteer management development uh, uh, that we would love to see you do or love to help you do. Um, But for today, we're really just trying to focus on COVID and uh, what's kind of the bare minimum team management that we need to get through this season still. Yeah, that's right. We yeah. So if you were going to take the time to go ahead and audit all your positions anyway, um, it might be a good time just to, if you don't have job descriptions um, to go ahead and write those out. And we ideally look we're looking for something half a page. Um, and so if you don't have those, develop them. And if you do have them, maybe revise them and update them and make sure that they that they're what you want them to be. And uh, maybe in the show notes today when we. Uh, write the full article for this episode. It'll come out on Wednesday. We'll send it via e- email. I don't know. Maybe we'll throw in a uh, a free template there for a, a volunteer job description um, template, so you can see what yep. that's like and make your job a little bit easier. All right, let's move on to point number two. Point number two is 
design your ideal team structure. So once you know, AJ, uh, what the your current structure is, what you have, what your teams are, um, who is in them, you need to start thinking about, well, what would be ideal? Um, maybe maybe uh, there's going to be some shifts, I think, uh, when it comes to your uh, teams, because in the past, we've had... Um, you might have like you might have to restructure what your your children's ministry classes are. This is something we talked about. Um, we've talked about now a couple of times. Mm-hmm. So like your maybe you had a kindergarten, first and second grade together in a class, but you're spreading that class out now so that the class will be less busy. You have a kindergarten and yeah. first grade class now, and then the second and third graders are together or something like that. Just hypothetically, well, you might now need more children's ministry volunteers to accommodate your shifting class needs. So once yeah. you've audited what you had, everybody just groaned. <laughs> yeah, I know. We couldn't get enough before. Now you're telling us we need more. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. And here's the reality. You, you probably had too few to start with, right? If you're watching right yeah. now, go ahead and let us know in the comments. If you already had too few volunteers before this thing started, <laughs> So there are some, <laughs> there are just some new realities, right? Like we we've got different mm-hmm. volunteer needs because our teams are shifting. We can't assume that our volunteers are going to be rushing back. Um, people are going to be nervous to come back to church. So you, you yeah, um, we can't assume that folks are going to be coming just you know beating the doors down to come back. So you're going to have to over recruit because there's going to be some people who just won't show up. Um, and then we already yeah. talked about the fact that you've probably got some folks who are in a co- category that are vulnerable, uh, either because of their health or their age, and they're not going to be back right away. And so you've got to start thinking about a new ideal. What is that new ideal in the post COVID? And it's not just about the next 90 days, AJ, this is for the next haul really of time. Um, and so the point yeah, we're making likely. here now, you know, I guess, the one good thing about this is, although, you know, your church may have opened up already this last Sunday or is next week or the week after, but you're likely not. I have not heard of any church that's planning to reopen children's ministry yet. So a lot of these volunteers that you need, you know, don't, I mean, calm down. You don't need them next Sunday. Um, maybe you do in June or July or August. So you've got time still to work on this. Um, you know, I mean, your more pressing volunteer needs are probably going to be in the usher department, which also is probably going to be larger than it used to be. Right. Um, because you got to manage seating and, and if you're going to do communion or anything like that. So, um, you know, greeters, that's going to be a different situation, but likely you're probably okay right now on children's, excuse me, children's ministry. And you've got time to build that out. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, um, there are also probably some churches that were one-service churches that are maybe mm-hmm. going to become two-service churches uh, in order to manage the the number of people who show up to any particular uh, service time. And so yeah. you've effectively doubled the number of volunteer needs that you have, potentially, without yeah. doubling the number of people who are there to, to be right. to be volunteers. And so you've got to yeah. rework those things. This really, over the next few months, is going to become a, a much bigger talked about and more critical issue of, of, of volunteer management, because we probably are going to be increasing our need for volunteers across a lot of areas in the church. Absolutely. So um, again, point number one, just to recap so far, you need to audit your volunteer positions. Know what they are. Again, um, I'm interested for those of you who are watching live, like how many of you already have that uh, in a centralized place where everybody on your team knows, here's all of our volunteer teams, here's who's on what. So uh, what we found find a lot when we work with churches in our leadership pipeline process is that the children's ministry team doesn't know that <laughs> some of their volunteers are also greeters. Um they just don't know that. They only know them in the context of they serve in children's ministry. And the gre- more often than not, um, it's the greeters who don't know that, the, uh, that, that those people also serve in children's ministry. Um, and so it's just important to have that list together. Okay. Um, AJ, anything else you want to add on the point number two, which is design your ideal team structure? 
Yeah. Well, again, and we talked about this in the first one, you know, I mean, a lot of these positions were going to be um, maybe the vulnerable population. So um, and I know that's going to be tough for for a lot of you smaller churches, especially that. I mean, it's not like you've got um, just gobs and gobs of people, you know, that you can recruit anyway. So we recognize that you're you're in a tough spot. Um, so you're really going to have to have a really good communications plan also for reaching out excuse me, to your non-vulnerable aged population and saying, we really need you guys stepping up right now. I mean, people that have never served before, um, we're probably going to have a place for you to help manage through this transition time. So be planning that out. How, how are we going to reach out to those people? How are we going to communicate with them? Um, and uh, and then, well, let's just move into point three then, Scott. Well, hold on uh, real fast. About uh, and let me add, uh, Chad has a really good question that I'm going to add. Uh, to the okay. broadcast here, which is um, about children's ministry. Do you think that, uh, that most churches will wait until phase three to begin children's ministry? That's a really good question on, I, on two points. Um, one, yes, I do think that um, a lot of churches are going to be waiting uh, till phase three to add back children's ministry, and in the meantime, just be doing family services. And so that's actually going to cut down on your volunteer needs right now. Um, as when you, when you first reopen, but that's why this time is so important. You need to start thinking about what does phase three look like, because that's when your new children's ministry structure may be implemented. I don't think it's likely that when you first go back to children's ministry, even if that's phase three, that it's going to look exactly the way it did back in January. You know, it's going to look different. People are going to have yeah. different expectations for class sizes, for cleaning, for cleanliness, for staffing, for all of that. And so, um, you know, you really need to leverage this time for the the audit, for the design, and then for um, good segue here to the the third step, which is uh, to here we go. If I can press recruit the button, and recruit train and train new, new leaders. Volunteer. Sorry, I was like, press this button. Now press this button. I was having some trouble. Uh, recruit and train new leaders. Um, you can tell this is really rocket science here. You know, audit your volunteer positions, design your ideal team, and recruit and train new leaders. But listen, this is, oh, I don't want you to miss this. Um, people don't do this. Like, it might not be rocket science, but we work with churches all the time, and they've just not really done this, and they're not doing it actively. Um, and the challenge right now, AJ, is that churches don't have, like, whatever their recruitment system was prior to this COVID situation, for the most part, those mm -hmm. things don't work right now. Um, so if the way you primarily recruited new volunteers was through like pulling the heartstrings from the pulpit and like, we really need more people to come rock babies. People can just, you know, fast forward past that um, if it's not live, right? Or, or that's when they yeah. go refill their cup of coffee while you're, while you're trying to make an emotional plea for, for more and new volunteers. Um, so if that was your key strategy for recruiting, that doesn't work anymore. Um, it, th let me just tell you, that was never a good strategy to begin with, <laughs> uh, but that, that one doesn't work. Um, you know, if you've suspended, which we hope you haven't, but if you've suspended, um, growth track or new member classes, if that was an avenue for you to recruit mm -hmm. new volunteers and you quit doing that, you've lost that avenue for recruitment. So it's really important that right now we start thinking about new ways to do recruitment, um, and so let's start there before we talk about training, cause we have a little bit, I want to specifically mention some tools that we're recommending for that, but let's, let's talk about recruitment first. AJ, in this new environment where we're still maybe, maybe weeks, um, maybe months, depending on where you live uh, away from going back to, to in-person services. And so most of our techniques need to be more or less virtual. What are some thoughts on best practices or good ways for us to be recruiting more volunteers in this context? Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind for me is going to be your small group channel. Uh, and hopefully that's been something that um, either you had or you started during this and you've been nurturing that along. Um, so I hope that's you. Um, but that's going to be a really great place right there to be able to move through your small group leaders and into those virtual groups that are happening online. Um, that's, you know, 
and even in a lot of churches, having groups serve together as groups, you know, in various capacities. Um, you don't need an entire small group opening, opening the door, um, but having them spread out so that you know, you know, group koinonia is serving, you know, on the third Sunday or whatever it is. Uh, but that's that's my first thing that comes to mind is work your groups channel. That's a great thought. <clears throat> on that same note, AJ, um, this is a recommendation that we we uh, make to churches when they're first building out their leadership pipeline and they still have such a huge gap in their recruitment. Um, that you can retool and reuse right now, which is um, roll out a divine design discovery um, small group class. So if you don't know what we mean by divine design, have any of you, um, you can mention in the comments, have you heard of the shape uh, approach from from uh, Rick Warren? Saddleback. Saddleback, Warren. yeah. yeah. Um, you know, helping people look at their, find their, find their shape, right? Strengths, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. heart, uh, abilities, personality, and experiences. And so looking at those five things to help a person discover who God has wired them to be and how God has wired them to serve. So if you were to do a, a small group series on shape um, or some other divine design curriculum that you find and you like, uh, you can then pivot that into, okay, now that you've audited and you've maybe put some job descriptions together— Based on your experiences and your personality and temperament and your gifting and all of that, here are some volunteer opportunities that would be good for you. And you can do this really yeah. low tech, right? Like make a little mm-hmm. PDF handout that's got all the volunteer positions and you put, you know, which uh, on that volunteer job description, which um, spiritual gifts um, are are best for which position. So if you're a small group leader, the spiritual gift of teaching and for your temperament, you're, you recommend people with uh, the D or an I on the disc um, in terms of temperament, right? Like, so put those things together and then follow up, like you said, with uh, small group leaders and say, okay, who wants to step up? Who's going to, to volunteer? So that'd be one way to do it. And you could start that right now or very soon. Yeah. Uh, um, that'd be a great summer summer project for for your groups preparing for the fall i would think a lot of phase three just kind of still thinking out loud here phase three is probably in a lot of cities is going to align with kind of back to school time Mm -hmm. uh, back to church time so uh you know this is the summertime is going to be really good chance to maybe work through some of these things i also think another thought is coming to mind scott since we're live um you know lots of things this is a chance for things to change in the church. I think people are expecting things not to be the same, and that's a whole other conversation for everything that can change, and we're going to keep talking about that over the next few weeks. But um, but the other thing is, now is a great time, and I think people will really be open to volunteering in ways that they haven't before or to stepping up when they never have volunteered before at all. Um, and putting that plea out there, that request um, that, hey, Things are different, and and we need you. We need you to be participating in what we're doing. I think you could probably expect to get a better response than maybe you've seen in the past. I think people are going to be open to doing that. So summer is going to be probably a great time to get this organized and prepare for kind of back to church, back to school, uh, September-ish launch. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I do think that that is sort of the – that's the virtual equivalent of the – call from the pulpit, right? Right. You're going to get right. some response from that, but it, you shouldn't hang your hat on, man, if I just send an email, yeah. you know, or post a video, I'm going to get all this response. That's just not how life works. Yeah. But um, if you do something more process oriented, like take the people who are in your small groups, take them through a process, mm-hmm. they're likely to respond to that. On that same note, um, this would be a great time to take your growth track or membership class digital uh, if you've not done that. And so if if part of your membership class, certainly if you're doing the growth track model, um, the finding your fit or finding your calling um, is part of that process. And so it's going to come up. And if you're doing it right, you're going to be asking people for a commitment to serving on a team uh, in that class. So if you've not yet digitized your your membership class or your growth track, like now's the time to do that. Um, and you can pick up some volunteers that way. And these don't have to be an either or thing, like use a blended strategy, do mm-hmm. the small group curriculum and the growth track and make some pleas through um, the uh, email and 
through the email, through the email and the internet and all those things the kids use. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> use your computer. Use your computer. And you, you can use the internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. The other one point, the last one I want to make in terms of recruitment is um, networking and leveraging existing volunteers to help you recruit. So if you view yourself as the primary or only person who can recruit, then that's not a good situation either. Um, you know, so if you go, all right, I've got these five teams and I need, you know, a volunteer a piece in each of these or five volunteers a piece in each of these, go to the people who are in those teams right now and say, who do you know um, who's not serving on any other team who might be good to, to serve in this? And will you invite them? You know, so activate the people who are serving on a team because they're the most passionate about it. Someone who works in your parking lot as a parking lot greeter is a better salesperson for working the parking lot than you are, right? Because they know the intricacies of it and how fun it is to get out there with their foam finger and wave people into parking spaces, right? Like, so activate your current volunteer base as recruiters for more volunteers. Um, because people, no offense, they are used to tuning you out. So if they only hear that ask from you, they'll probably ignore it. But if they hear it from, from somebody on boots on the ground, they might mm. not ignore it. Yeah, so, good point. So I think that we've given you four ideas there that you can leverage uh, for yourself. Let's talk about training new leaders. Um, again, I think digitizing this is something that should have already happened uh, prior to COVID-19, but now you've got an excellent opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm just going to make a real clear, you can do this a number of ways. So let me give you sort of the do it DIY, do it yourself, free option would be to maybe shoot some videos and put them on YouTube or Vimeo or in a Facebook group and do it that way. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do it that way and it costs you nothing. So let me be really clear about that. The challenge with doing it that way is you don't know who's in, who has taken what training um, and you don't know how far they've gotten along in that training, whether or not they actually watched the video, whether or not they actually comprehended anything from the video. And you could cobble this together with like various tracking things, like put together a Google form to, that people have to fill out or, um, you know, some sort of a, a quiz or assessment. You can do all this and piecemeal it together yourself, which would be fine. Um, but how many of you... In the comments, let us know if you've heard of ServeHQ. ServeHQ.church is the is the URL for the um, the service that we're talking about right now. ServeHQ.church. Actually, I can probably just write that. I'll it, do that. Thank you, AJ. ServeHQ.church. They have a um, a tool inside of uh, of that website called Trained Up. And it gives you the ability to shoot your own training videos and have online courses, um, like onboarding type courses um, for folks. And um, the nice thing, there's two nice things about it. Number one, you can shoot your own videos right within the platform itself. So there's like a video recording feature. Um, and you can create your own like children's ministry training and click record and record it and upload it. You never have to leave it. You don't have to record it on your video and then upload it, although you can do that, but you can record it right in the program. The second nice thing about ServeHQ um, and the Trained Up platform is they have a library of over 500 videos already made. So it, you don't have to go in and um, record all of your own training. They already have a lot of training that's going to be the same from church to church. So you can, if you've got something that's unique to your church, record your own video. Um, if you, if you have something that's just going to be standard across the board, like things in regards to safety or whatever, they have 500 videos already pre-recorded. Things about greeting, best practices for greeting, best practices for security, all kinds of things like that. And you can just drag and drop their pre-recorded stuff straight into your your training module and blend that in with your own. Then you can put people into courses. You'll know when they've watched videos. You can track that. You can set in assessments, ask questions to tell whether or not they actually recorded it and all of that. So it's a it's a uh, online training platform called servehq.church 
And um, just want to let you know, I, I texted Scott Magdalene. He's the uh, founder, the, the CEO of Serve HQ. I sent him a text message today and said, hey, any chance you could just help us give something away to folks watching the podcast today um, since I want to tell them about Serve HQ? And he was nice enough. This sounds so much like a commercial. Does this sound like a commercial? Oh. <laughs> uh, I could show you my text messages with him today to prove you that I really just want to help you. Um, and uh, da, 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 da. and so he he made this code. So they're typically just giving away a 14-day trial um, standard if you go to servehq.church. But if you use the code MALFERS when you sign up, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S, for those of you who are listening to the audio-only version of this, spelled again for you, M A L. P H U R S, all caps, Malfers. Um, you're going to get a 45 day trial instead of a 14 day trial. So that'll take you well into um, this next season, right, AJ? Like you can get sure some would. stuff together. So M A L P H U R S, Malfers um, gets you. In the comments Thank there. you. 45 day trial of Survey HQ. You literally have nothing to lose. Um, and everything to gain in terms of training up your your volunteer teams and making it way easier on yourself. Um, we had somebody ask, what about using the units feature on Facebook? Do you know if anyone has found this to be successful? I don't know of anyone who's found it to be successful. That doesn't mean it's not a good tool. Um, it's just I don't know anyone who's used it. Uh, but it certainly is an option. So yeah, use use the free stuff that you want to use um, for sure. But um, this is also free for 45 days anyway. <laughs> you could you could maybe uh, train a lot of folks in the next 45 days for free. And to be able to pull from their content library, AJ, is a huge win. I don't know yeah. if anybody else is pressed for time the way we are. Um, but if, if the idea of recording hours and hours and hours of training content for your leaders does not sound all, all that appealing and you'd like to pull from 500 existing videos. Yeah. Um, this might yeah, be for some a good option. general use things. I mean, you might have something super specific that you still need to do custom, but yeah, for a lot of that general use stuff. Wow. Push the button. Yep. And, um, by the way, if you want to see, I'll put this in the comments as well. If you just want to see what it looks like on the back end, there's a, um, there is a, uh, demo video for you guys. So servehq.church, highly recommending that to you guys as a tool for training um, and doing that online. And I think that if you make that switch now, you're not going to regret it and you're going to continue to do that. I think one of the biggest challenges that we see with churches is that they never get around to training, AJ, because mm -hmm. um, they've got to find a time where everyone can be there for the training. We don't do the small. We only, we only do the small group training once a year because it's so hard to get a time together to do small group training. Well, if you can make that a digital thing where you know seventy five percent of the training is something that people can do on their own, then I can only worry about the twenty five percent of it that has to be done in person and is more relational anyway. So if I bring on a small group leader, you know seventy five percent of the training is just content. Twenty five percent of the training is is job shadowing and learning on the job, right? And so yeah. um, I really think this is a transition that, that you won't regret making if you do it now. So um, again, want to just really encourage you to go to servehq.church, use the code MALFERS, uh, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S, all caps, for a 45-day trial on that. Um, and so thanks to Scott Magdalene, the founder over there at ServeHQ, for putting that together on the fly, literally. Like, I sent him a text and said, what moments can you ago. do? Yeah, moments ago. I said, what can you do? And he did that for you. So, um, all right. So our three-step process, AJ, will you uh, recap that for us? Yeah. So point one, audit your volunteer positions. So if you <laughs> get your spiral notebook out if you have to, but write down what are our needs uh, and who is presently serving there. The point here is uh, we've got to figure out who is going to be able to come back? When are they going to be able to come back? What are our new needs going to be? Um, design your ideal team. So uh, we probably don't need children's ministry right now, but we will in a few months. But oops, we need, you know, 20 ushers instead of five. So uh, you've got to work out who, what, what are our new teams or at least our temporary new teams going to look like? And then finally recruit and train these leaders. So you've got to be able to work through communication channels to 
put the need out there. Um, and then what are you going to do with them whenever whenever they raise their hand and say yes? Well, we've got to get them up to speed on where they're going to be serving and what the needs are there. So uh, you can train them internally or get some help on the outside from ServeHQ. Absolutely. So three steps. If you've not done them, start now. Um, it's going to take you longer than you think because, by the way, you have all those other things that you also have to do. Um, <laughs> this is not the, your only job. you got other things going on. So a um, couple of things just to uh, let you know about to help help you in this, all, all free things. Number one, um, if you've not gotten that ultimate reopening checklist, or I'm sorry, ultimate reopening resource bundle, it's got the uh, reopening checklist and it has our uh, guidelines, roadmap to reopen phase guidelines. It has um, a free webinar training that we did last week on reimagining your 2020 vision. We put together an action plan template for you to use to decide um, and make a plan for how you're going to move forward. All four of those tools are in just a Dropbox folder. So I already put the link in the comments where you can click scroll on that. Up. Yeah, scroll up towards the top and it's in there somewhere. Um, click on that. Download that resource completely free. Um, and uh, ServeHQ is giving you 45 days free to try out that resource, see if it's a good fit for you. Um, hopefully it is. And then last... Uh, but not least, we want to let you know next week we got a we're going to have a special guest. Yeah, um, that's exciting. We yeah. don't often have guests on, but uh, we probably will more here coming up in the future. But we're having uh, author Michael Anthony on the podcast with us. Uh, he wrote a book called A Call for Courage that was really great, and uh, also leads a ministry called Courage Matters that you can find at CourageMatters.com. So we're looking forward to that conversation with Michael next week. So be sure and tune in back here same time for that. That's right. So um, listen. Just remember, may the 4th be with you. Yes, I, if for those watching live, this is a uh, Kylo Ren lightsaber. I um, probably should have got some, like the, the light side lightsaber from my son's room. Um, but I grabbed the first one I saw, which was for the dark side. Um, <sighs> <laughs> no one else cares about Star Wars like I do. And tomorrow... Cinco de Mayo on a Taco Tuesday. You can't beat that. Gosh, this is what an amazing week. Yeah. Out yeah. of out of quarantine in many places. May the 4th, Taco Tuesday, Cinco de Mayo. That's right. Is this the greatest time to be alive or what? Things are starting to finally look up. <laughs> is this what they mean about the light at the end of the tunnel? I think it is. Oh, we love you guys so much. We uh, can't wait to see you next week with Michael Anthony joining us, talking about how to be a courageous leader in this crazy time. And uh, don't forget to uh, read today's show notes uh, at malfirstgroup.com forward slash 38, um, starting on Wednesday. It's not live there yet. Um, malfirstgroup.com forward slash 38. Check out the offer from ServeHQ for free, 45 days. Um, that's going to be awesome. We love you. Thank you. And we will see you next time.